we are once again um, enjoyed our fellowship today it's been good thankful that uh, the Lord has allowed us to be here continue to pray of course for uh, the work here uh, the flyers that we sent out <clears throat> thankful that the Lord allowed us to get about 5,000 of those out um, we got about another 4,500 or so maybe a little bit more uh, at the house uh, we need to start working on getting those out too but continue to pray that the Lord would use those uh, for his glory all right <clears throat> we are back in Matthew chapter 26 Matthew chapter 26 uh, we read all of chapter 26 this morning in the first part of chapter 27 uh, all the way down to where Judas threw back the money uh, that he had taken and went out and hung himself, right? But most of our focus this morning <clears throat> was kind of uh, on um, how the Gospels harmonize, and even what may seem like a contradiction is usually fairly easily explainable. Um, and when you look at it, we can absolutely take John chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 26, and we can make those two things fit together, right? And we talked about how that uh, the Lord had described that uh, after he had told them about the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, the signs of the end times and his second coming, that it was two days before the Passover and that the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And how that the chief priests were already taking counsel and meeting together how they might uh, kill Jesus and how that we backed up a few steps, a few days uh, in order to talk about uh, the story at Bethany and the anointing of the Lord Jesus to prepare him for burial and how that what that woman had done was uh, not, it was not a waste. It was something that was of great value uh, and that this woman was going to be talked about uh, anywhere the gospel of the Lord is declared. And that from that, Judas... Uh, seems like that was a, a, a final straw or something, but Judas then went and prepared with the chief priest how that he might find an opportunity to betray the Lord without the presence of the multitudes, which is exactly what the chief priests were looking for. I actually think the chief priests were not thinking about the next week. <laughs> they were thinking, let's get past the festival Let's get past the feast and let's figure out how we, can, how we can get him. But Judas comes and provides that perfect opportunity to take the Lord sooner rather than later. Uh, and, you know, to them it looks like this great victory. But in reality, it's just yet another fulfillment of the Old Testament scripture. It's just another step in the Lord getting to this place where he is going to give his life for us, which again, we've talked about this before, seemed like a victory for those against Jesus. In reality, it was the failure. <laughs> it, like, it was victory, but it wasn't victory for them. Uh, it was the fulfillment of what was supposed to happen to the Messiah. Now, <clears throat> as we continue to read throughout this, there's some more stuff here. Uh, if you look in, in uh, Matthew chapter 26, Let's pick up here in verse 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go unto the city to such a man, and say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto the Lord, Is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. Now, the next section, and we'll read this too. And as they were eating... 
Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, gave to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, this is, in my opinion, and not everybody agrees with this, but I think it's pretty clear that this is one, I'm going to say event. Um, I don't know that that's exactly what I mean. This is one time, right? Um, they have come together with the ex very intentional purpose of taking the Passover together. And they start to go through and eat this meal together. And then um, there seems to be, I don't, I don't, I hate to use the phrase added to, but Jesus does something that is not normal for the Passover. Okay? Because he takes and he breaks the bread and he starts to talk about how that the breaking of that bread was his body and to take of that. And as he takes the cup, he starts to talk about that this is, this is a symbol of my shed blood that is, that is shed for the remission of sins. Listen, we can talk about the similarities in this passage to the Jewish Passover. And there is a ton of similarities. But those statements, those statements were not normal for a Passover. And this is actually where the Lord institutes what we call the Lord's Supper. This is, um, this is something that is uh, different. I do not believe that uh, as uh, the Jewish people would have taken the Passover, that they would have, talking to, they would have broken the bread and said, you know, this is, this is the Messiah's body, take eat. They wouldn't have talked about drinking of the cup and representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's different. This is new. This is not something that has been done to this point. The indication is even that the this is new to the apostles. Now, y you and I don't really practice the Passover. Um, not, not like the Jewish people would have practiced the Passover, right? Uh, once a year at a certain time of the year on the the, the the 14th of the month and then the 15th becomes the start of the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which lasts for seven days. I mean, these were very structured, very, uh, very structured feasts and days. You know, when Independence does the Lord's Supper, it's not an eight day thing, right? Um, and on the first day, they don't, <laughs> they don't go slaughter the lamb and sprinkle the blood and separate the fat and do the burning of this and th th we don't do that right now that is a perfect representation of the Lord Jesus Christ what's amazing to me and and, and I don't really we're probably not going to stop to do it right now but I would love to come back and actually do a study of how those feasts and those events were such a perfect representation of the work of Jesus Christ. It's really amazing when you look at it, how, how much those pictured the coming Messiah and what he would go through and what he would do. I mean, all the way down to, we think about the Passover being the obvious one, but, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, and that week, uh, we think about, um, even the, the first fruits, the Feast of the First Fruits, and all the way down to Pentecost. All of those things represented some part of the redemptive story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's amazing when you look at it. It's just neat. So we'll have to come back at some point and try to pick up and, and do a, a little bit of that. But I, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface today. So before I get 
too far off track. Let me back up a little bit. Verse 17, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Now it is important to understand that when you look at the Old Testament, the Passover, okay, uh, the, the Passover and um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread are technically in the Old Testament law t- two separate events. They're two days, like Passover takes place on the 14th, the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread takes place on the 15th, and then goes for seven days. Um, but oftentimes, by the time you get to the first century, these two things are really spoken of uh, almost interchangeable. When people talked about the Passover, they were talking about the Passover week. Or when they talked about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were talking about the whole event. And the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was, was kind of the, the, the Passover, right? And so um, don't, don't be confused. Don't misunderstand. There's, there's not a contradiction. Uh, it's not wrong. Uh, it's just that these things kind of all got mashed together a little bit, okay? So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in this case, would have been referring to, uh, to the Passover, right? So if I remember the Old Testament correctly, that's the 14th day, okay? Now remember, from a Jewish perspective, uh, their days were structured a little different than ours, right? We think about our day starts, oddly enough, we're just confusing people, I think. Our day starts at midnight, right? In the middle of us sleeping, Because a new day starts at midnight. Well, that's kind of odd, right? We go to sleep in one day and we wake up in another day and the day changed while we were in bed. That's the way our days work, midnight to midnight. Jewish days don't work like that. Jewish days, interestingly enough, go back to when you look at the Old Testament, right? The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. A Jewish day starts in the evening. Okay? So the first half of a Jewish day is actually in the evening. And then it goes over and you finish the day. Our next day, right? (laughs) It's kind of the way that works. I I should have brought a PowerPoint for you guys, because for those of you that are younger and haven't heard this before, it's kind of confusing. But again, keep in mind, their days do not start at midnight. They start in the the evening, okay? About the time the sun starts to go down, uh, let's call it 6 o'clock, about the time the sun starts to go down is when their day would start. And then you'd go through, you'd sleep, You'd finish out your day, you'd have some time of sleep, you'd wake up in the morning, you'd finish the day, okay? So when we talk about the 14th day, it's not like that 14th day started at midnight. The 14th day, you actually had some time at the beginning of the day to do some stuff. Then you slept, then you did some more stuff, right? And sometimes that's confusing for us when we read uh, the story of the, of the New Testament and the things surrounding Christ's birth. Because, well, if it was on the Passover day, well, then how could this happen? And then he was at trial at night, and then how could... But remember, their days aren't like ours. Their days are different. So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, as we read some of the other, as we read some of the other uh, passages in the other Gospels, it's even more specific about this uh, place where he's going to go, and there's a house already prepared. It actually talks about that the house is already furnished. It's already set up. It's already ready to go. And yet there is a preparing that still needs to be done. Um, It actually says that he sends them to make ready 
the Passover. Now, they would have had to have done some stuff. Um, I don't know how much was already done since the house was already furnished and how much they still had to do. Uh, but people like John Gill would say, well, when it says to make ready the house or to make ready the Passover, that would have included going and finding a lamb and having the lamb slaughtered and having the stuff done that needed to be done and then bringing it back and then setting up all of the other parts of the feast of the Passover and the things that would have to be done. As well as, by the way, one last check to make sure that there was no leaven in the house. Understand that in the Bible, leaven is the representation of sin. And it's really interesting when you look at the, at the Jewish preparation for the Passover and then the feast, the, the, the week of the unleavened bread. It's really an amazing picture of sin. And in a lot of ways, the practice of trying to get ready for Passover very much, in my opinion, shows that you can't actually accomplish what needs to be done. Because when you think about it, okay, I know you kids don't get this, what leaven is. Um, okay, so leaven is like yeast. And if you're going to make bread, if you were, we were at Isaac's house, and Isaac is a big fan of making his own bread, right? Well, listen, you, you mix that yeast in there with that dough, and as that yeast starts to do what it's going to do, it starts to swell, right? And it changes that bread. Well, oftentimes in the Bible, leaven is represented as, as sin. And you, you need to get that leaven out of your life. Well, if you were a Jewish family preparing for the, the Passover, listen, there would have been a time of preparation. And that would have involved getting rid of the leaven in your house. In their case, the upper room where they were staying, right? I want you each to think about your house today, okay? Think about your house. I'm looking at some of you guys, and I know you like to eat. Guess what? Cheerios have leaven in them. So before you could take the Passover, before you could take the Passover, you would have to get rid of every last Cheerio that's in your house. Including the ones that fell down in the seat, the couch cushions while you were eating Cheerios and watching a movie or playing your video game. Listen, they took this serious. And if you've read about what they would do to prepare for the feast, uh, for these feasts, man, it was a big deal. We, we, the kids, the kids talk to Tanya about when spring comes and it's time for spring cleaning and they know, I look at the, look at the face on this one right here. They know it's going to be deep cleaning day. Listen, to prepare for the Passover was a deep cleaning event. And everybody would scour the house looking for anything that had leaven. And it would be taken out and burned. Like, get rid of it. So, Elliot, did you get your Cheerios out of the cabinet? And did you find all the ones that were under your bed? And Joe was trying to get the ones out of the couch cushions. And by the way, Sierra's trying to clean out the bread that we've got in our corner cabinet, right? Because guess what? Bunny bread, it got leaven in it. I know it tastes really good, but bunny bread has plenty of leaven in it. You're going to have to get rid of the bunny bread out of the cabinet. But listen, she's kind of, well, she's one of our family, so she's short. She reaches up in that cabinet and she takes all that bread out and she throws that away. But listen, unless she gets a step stool and steps up in there and she looks in that cabinet and she realizes that there's crumbs of bread. She has not cleaned the house of leaven. And she's going to have to get something and she's going to have to clean all that leaven out. 
while Jasmine is digging through the cupboards downstairs and all that stuff that we've got down in that cupboard stored away, ready to go, that has leaven in it, it's got to go. Because come the time of the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, you're not supposed to have any leaven in your house. I have to admit, looking at my house, I'm not sure I could actually remove it all. I would forget a crumb somewhere or miss a crumb somewhere. You start to understand like how deep you have to dive in order to root out the leaven that would be in your house. And it's a picture of sin. You can find the big obvious things. Hey, that box of cereal, that big bug, bag of bunny, bunny bread, yeah, that's not hard to find. But what about all of those pieces of that stuff that fell down in those seat cushions? That's not so easy. Listen, sin has a way of permeating our life. It's a really good picture. You think about some of the stuff that they did as the, 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 the feasts and the festivals and how they would be a memorial and a picture of something. Oh, that's really, really, really vivid when you start to dig deeper into it. So I don't know how much had already been done and what still needed to be done. But listen, these disciples had to go prepare this room for the Passover. Now, we talk about how that these tie together. This is another example of where it says that the disciples uh, ask, where wilt thou that we prepare? And the Lord said, go to such a man, and then he sends them. It doesn't tell us how many disciples here in Matthew, but when you read like Mark and Luke and John, you find that there were two disciples that he sent. And another gospel tells you that it was like Peter and John. They were the ones the Lord sent to go prepare this room and to prepare the Passover. And so, uh, listen, we read these in just a few short sentences, but this was a big deal. There was a lot of preparation that went into preparing for this feast of the Passover. Sometime, I would like for our group, we've got, uh, we've got a, a DVD set and some books that we've got. I've got one of them up here with me. But it goes through all the different elements of what would have been in the Jewish Passover. And the guy that gives this uh, is, was born and raised in a Jewish family. And then as an adult, he actually uh, was saved and recognized Jesus as his Messiah. And he comes back and he talks about how all of this represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's really, really vivid when you look at it. And even the things that may not be listed specifically in the Old Testament, but over time became Jewish tradition of the Passover meal, it's shocking, actually, how specific it is. Uh, even down to the fact that there were uh, the bag that the, the unleavened bread was in was a three-fold bag. And there were three pieces, one in the first level, the second level, the third level, and they were all separated, but they were in a bag called the unity bag. And part of the feast was to take out the middle piece of the unity and to break it, to wrap it up and to hide it. And then part of the fest, part of the Passover, they would go find it. And whoever found it would be rewarded with something. And then that piece would be broken again. And it actually represented hmm, the son of the Trinity, right? Uh, and you break this, and his body was broken. And all of this was done at just the right point in the festival uh, of the feast to represent the point in time of the redemption because they would have, there were four cups. Whenever you would do today, if you were to do a, a Jewish Passover meal, there would be four cups. And some of this happened at the time of the third cup. And the third cup represents the redeeming of the children of Israel. And that, right before the taking of the third cup, is when that middle piece would be broken. 
And so just very vivid when you start to look at some of that stuff. And um, as, you, as you would think about that, uh, the fourth cup, according to Jewish tradition, represented, they left it in an empty chair because it was supposed to represent Elijah who had not yet come, right? Well, of course, now Elijah, based on the definition of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? John the Baptist was represented Elijah and the Messiah has come. And then they would take that fourth cup and it was a, a time of praise, right? Each one of these steps represented a different thing and it walked through the deliverance from Egypt and it walked through their redemption and it walked through all these down to this fourth cup which was a time of praise and after the and after the fourth cup was a time when they would sing in him and uh, it's commonly believed that they would sing uh, Psalms chapter 113 through Psalms chapter 118 and um, it's just it would represent they're looking forward to this time of Elijah coming because when Elijah come, the Messiah would come, right? You see that, I mean, I'm, I'm, just like, I'm just like hitting, barely hitting the highlights and you really start to see this thing they were doing, how close it resembled the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and how this last Passover that he would have taken with his disciples, how it was so much of a final fulfillment of some of this. And his later this night, later this very night, the Lord would be betrayed, put on trial. The next morning he would be hung on the cross and he would die. All in that day. Understand? Because again, the Jewish day starts in the evening. This meal would have started in the evening on the 14th. When Jesus is hung on the cross the next morning at 9 o'clock, it's still the 14th. When Jesus dies at roughly, I think it was 3 o'clock, guess what? It's still the 14th. The picture and the representation that Jesus Christ has of the Passover lamb is perfect. Let me back up just a little bit and even explain more about how perfect it is. Did you know that in the Old Testament, whenever you were going to have this lamb that was going to be your Passover, it was supposed to be taken on the 10th of the month and put aside and watched, judged, so to speak, to determine whether or not it really was a perfect lamb. And between the 10th and the 14th was a time of trying that lamb, so to speak, to see if it really was the perfect lamb. What just happened in the book of Matthew leading up to this Passover meal? What happened? By the way, about the 10th, <laughs> Jesus Christ was tried by the Pharisees and he beat them. <laughs> he was tried by the chief priests and the Sadducees and he beat them. The scribes challenged him and he beat them. By the end of this night, he will have been tried by the Roman government and Pilate will have said, I find no fault in him. Do you actually begin to see just how perfect Jesus Christ fits this Passover lamb that has come and is going to die for the sins of his people? For how many thousands of years had people come together to celebrate the Passover, which represented, yes, God's deliverance from Egypt? But it represented so much more than just God's deliverance from Egypt. It represented their need of redemption, their need of covering, and how only the shed blood of the lamb could do that. You know what's interesting to me? 
When you look at the, and I'm not following my notes at all, so who knows where we're going to end up tonight. You know what's interesting to me? When you look at that stuff in the Old Testament, and you look at the plagues, right? You know, most of those plagues, the children of Israel were actually spared from without having to do anything. Those plagues were enacted upon the people of Egypt. But this place where the Jews were was, didn't have that most of the time. When you look at the, you look at the dialogue about the death of the firstborn child, did you know that the Jews were actually not exempt from that? What would have happened if the Jewish people who had seen plague after plague not affect them, what would have happened if they had sat in their homes and just waited for that night to pass? their firstborn child would have died. Because what was the commandment? When I pass over and I see the blood, right? When I come through and I see the blood, I will pass over you. What does that mean? It represents that all of man was subject to judgment. Egyptian Jew, didn't matter. That night, when the angel of the Lord was going to come through, anything that wasn't covered in the shed blood would have the judgment come on their house. That plague was different. That plague is actually a true representation of man's lost condition and how an innocent lamb needs to die and the shed blood so that the judgment of God passes over. Jesus Christ came, completely and totally and perfectly fulfilled the law, was even referred to as the Lamb of God, Behold, the Lamb of God. Went through a time of trying, and everybody backed away and said, don't know how to fight against that. And then willingly gave himself, was led as a lamb to the slaughter. died on the cross. And what happens when somebody repents of their sins, turns in faith and trust to the Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing what they are, recognizing who He is, asking Him for forgiveness, looking to Him, that one hung up like Moses put the serpent up in the wilderness. They're redeemed. They're forgiven. When God looks at them, all he sees is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. All of those lambs that had been slain prior to this night were nothing but a symbol. Nothing but a symbol. The lamb that died this day was the perfect lamb of God. The one whose blood really could cover your sins. The only one who could cover your sins. And as he prepares and he takes this Passover with his disciples for this final time,
man, I wonder if a few days after Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and they know who he is again and what he's done and they see the end result of all of this, I wonder if they would look back and think about all that Passover (laughs) and how Jesus Christ has once again shown them how he is the perfect representation of that. You know, it's interesting. I... You get into some controversy to some degree on some of this. There are some people that believe that this meal here, or the one in John, um, usually it's the one in John. uh, They look at the one in John where Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and then he talks about whoever he dips the sop with would be the one that betray him. Uh, And then he talks about the Lord's Supper Um, some people look at that and they say, well, that's not the night of the Passover. That was a few days before. That's a separate thing. I don't believe that. It's just, there's just too many similarities between the two for me. Um, but again, that's me. Some people believe that Jesus took the Passover a day early, uh, and that, uh, the rest of the nation of Israel didn't take it until the next night while he was, uh, being buried. Um, there, there's different, all kinds of, you start to get into the details of this and there's three or four different versions of how people see this. And I'll be honest, I wish I could stand up here and give you such a detailed explanation that, that one of those three or four different versions stands out above everything else and there's no way anybody could ever argue differently. I, I can't. Now, I can tell you what I read tells me this was the night of the Passover. They were coming together to take the Passover. The similarities between this and the Gospel of John's story of the meal, they are just too similar to me to be able to say they're two different events. So to me, the one that makes the most sense is on the first day, which would be the Passover, the 14th, Jesus came together. He had this last Passover. And as the Passover ends, he takes the ending of that Passover and he institutes the Lord's Supper. Now, I believe that it came from that Passover meal, that he took that Passover meal and he added what we now call the Lord's Supper. Sometime in the middle of that, I believe Judas left. Now, if you want my opinion, Judas was probably there when the Lord washed the disciples' feet. Although there is some debate about that. I do not believe that that Judas was there to the very end. Matter of fact, the indication is he got up and left after sharing the sop with the Lord. And it seems like the Lord, after doing that, is when the Lord actually broke the bread, said what he was going to say about that, took the, the, the third cup, and said what he was going to say about that. It seems as if Judas left somewhere between those things, right? Matter of fact, it's, you say, well, why would a guy leave in the middle of the Passover? It probably is unusual. But remember that it even comments that the disciples, as they were watching, assumed that he needed to go purchase something for the meal or that he had something he was supposed to be taking care of. Him leaving required some comment about, oh, well, he must have something that has to be done. Judas seems to have left. And as he left, he went and he found those chief priests. And he said, Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. And while he is off doing that, the Lord institutes what we call the Lord's Supper, and he gives us this picture of the breaking of the bread, and he he manifests or he makes clear that, hey, this thing that we do of this breaking of this bread represents my broken body that I've given for you. And this cup of redemption 
represents my blood that was given for the remission of sins. And then he tells them, I'm not going to partake of this anymore until the day that I partake of it with you in the kingdom of my father. Now, I don't know. The guy that wrote this believes that that's talking about the fourth cup. That on the third cup, the cup of redemption, Jesus broke the bread and talked about his shed blood. And on the fourth cup, which would have represented Elijah hasn't come yet, well, now represents that the Lord hasn't come yet. And he says, I'm not going to partake of this until that day that I take part of this with you when I have come back for my people. Now, I don't know, right? You get into some stuff there where you have to kind of make some assumptions. But it is interesting that the Lord has left and he is coming back for us. And one day, there seems to be an indication that one day we will all be together and we will partake together of the fruit of this vine. He didn't say, this is the last time I'm ever going to take part of the fruit of this vine. He said, until I take it with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, I don't know what all that means. I don't know all the details about how that's going to shake out. But it is what he, it is what he told them. The other thing that I want you to know is that this idea of doing this is something we were supposed to continue. In 1 Corinthians, and we won't turn there for time's sake, but in 1 Corinthians, he recounts the words of the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians, it states that this is to be done in remembrance of me. And it's this idea that this was not just something that they did this one time and it was done. This was something that the people of God, the church, the churches of God are supposed to come together as a church. And they are supposed to do this. And while they do it, it's supposed to be a remembrance of what God has done for them. A remembrance, honestly, that... No matter how hard we tried, we couldn't root out every ounce and every crumb of sin that existed in our life. A remembrance that Jesus Christ had to come and die and shed his blood to pay for our sins. A remembrance that because he came and died and shed his blood for us, that when the judgment of God comes, it's going to pass over us. Because he's going to see the blood on the doorpost, so to speak. But listen, for those watching, a remembrance that if you're not covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, judgment comes. For us, a remembrance and a celebration of what God has done for us. Jesus Christ took this Passover night and he used it to teach his disciples even more about how he fulfills this perfect Lamb of God. And he gives us something that we're supposed to do from now on. Now listen, do you know? And if, and if I was born and raised... Jewish heritage, and I'm not just talking about a Jewish religion, but if I was born and raised Jewish, Israel her Israeli heritage, okay, I don't know what I would do about some of these feasts and festivals and stuff like this. But listen, do you know what? Nobody, after this night, <laughs> there were aspects, honestly, the symbol had been fulfilled. I know that there continued to be Passover meals and Passover lambs slain, but listen, the Passover had been slain. The Lamb of God 
had been slain for us. Within a few short years, something would happen that would cause it to be impossible. I mean impossible to fulfill exactly the way the Passover became to be, right? I get it. Some of the Passover stuff coming out of Egypt, that was different. But you know, once the temple was built, once the temple was built, there were some more rules around how the Passover was supposed to be done. The temple's gone. There was no more taking the lamb into the temple <laughs> to have it slain and treated and prepared just right. That's done. That's past. Can't do it anymore. The Lord Jesus Christ was our perfect lamb who died for our sins. What a picture. What a picture of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in it, he gave us this last uh, this Lord's Supper that we today still do as remembrance. Now as a mission work, we haven't done that. And honestly, it weighs heavy on me sometimes. And it's something that we need to be thinking about and talking about and figuring out what are we supposed to do. When we get to the point where we're ready and can do this, I want everybody in this room from the youngest one to understand that this is a remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. He, his broken body and his shed blood, his shed blood, which was the only thing that could be given for the remission of sins. It says that they went out after this in verse 30, and they sung in him, and they went out into the Mount of Olives. It is very interesting to me, and I don't know, I honestly can't tell you exactly what I think about how the Passover and the Lord's Supper tie together. But it is very interesting to know that after that fourth cup, that tradition, Jewish tradition, when you take the Passover, after that fourth cup, you sing in him. It's specific enough that at least from a tradition perspective, the Jewish people could tell you what they would sing at the end of the Passover. Psalms chapter 113 and 114 were sang early in the Passover. And chapter 15, 16, 17, and 18 were sung at the very end of the Passover meal. And they are songs of great praise to God. Songs of great praise. Because when you look at the Passover, it represents the deliverance and the redemption. And it ends with the praise of God for what he's done. Just a really neat, really neat picture. And I know we didn't get too far uh, tonight, but hopefully it's been an encouragement to you. And even in this, man, I'm just skimming the surface. I'm just skimming the surface. Um, the next things that we'll cover, we won't cover them tonight. But uh, the next things we'll cover are going to be Peter's denial, or I should say the prophecy of Peter's denial, and then Jesus' prayer on Gethsemane, and then the final betrayal and trial of Jesus Christ. Okay, those are the things that we'll plan on covering next week, Lord willing. Uh, we'll get into some of that. All right, Brother Philip, if you would come and lead us in.